Hello, hello, everyone. Happy Friday to you all. I'm my centered full thirds. This is my first stream from this computer, so I had to. I just got pinged by Twitch because I thought it was a, fra a fraudulent login. So apologies for the delay. <laughs> um, hope you all are having a great, a great day. Boy, I'm looking scraggly. Uh, it's about time for that post post summer shave, I think. Uh, let's see. You can't see it really um, because my window is just kind of like whited out over there. Uh, but we are in State Fair Central right now. Uh, our offices are very close to the Minnesota State Fair. Uh, we're basically on the south side of the fairground. And unlike other state fairs, it is like within the city limits. There's public transit to it, and it is a big deal. And so I feel like I work in the middle of a musical fe music festival. I like bike to work, and there are just pedestrians everywhere. Um, and so right out my window are just, uh, I don't know, maybe 20, 30 cars and people getting in and out and all that stuff. Um, it is it is something else. Uh, okay, cool. I just had to make sure I posted all that stuff out. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about Oath. Uh, I've been meaning, we mean to update you all. Um, I have an update uh, for, for, the, for the crowdfunding campaign. Because of the state fair, a lot of staff um, take vacation time because it is a nightmare to get to work. And so I didn't want to post an update without having all the usual people here. And so we thought we'd just wait till next week to do it. But I want to talk about Oath, and I want to talk about Oath with all of you. Uh, and so I thought we'd just, we'd just do it this way. I hope you can all hear me uh, well enough. Again, this is a slightly new setup. Um, I had been using a desktop computer right after Root funded. I built a bunch of desktop computers for the office. And it's it's actually, it's a fine computer. It's in pretty good shape, but it was a, about time for, I was like next up on the computer upgrade uh, list and so I just got myself a new machine, uh, but I haven't streamed from it, so there might be some technical issues that we will sort out as we go. Uh, okay, let me make sure I can see our little chat window. There you are, excellent. So uh, here's what we're gonna do today. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Oath and what we've been doing. It has been a really wonderful, busy summer here. And uh, my gosh, there's just a lot to talk about. So the, the Kickstarter is over. Um, sorry, there's a uh, pledge now in Kickstarter. I'm using kind of old graphics. Um, the, the Kickstarter is over. The late pledges we will have open for a long time. So you can still you can still late pledge. Uh, happy late pledging to anybody who wants to late pledge. Um, but the campaign uh, just did exceptionally well. And I've, I've said this a bunch, and I'll say it again. Um, we had our own internal expectations for the Oath campaign, and the campaign blew past it. And so that meant when we were going into the work this summer, uh, we got to think uh, very creatively about what we might want to do to Oath and you know the, the, the scope of things. Uh, so part of what the, the success of the campaign bought, and this is going to sound quite counterintuitive. So when a campaign does about as well as you expect, um, there isn't a lot of uncertainty, and so what you end up wanting to do is sort of get through the project uh, as well and as quickly as you can, and then move to the next project. I mean, that's we're to get we work for a game company. Uh, it makes sense that after a game funds, you deliver it as best you can, and then you move on to the next thing. When a campaign does really well, though, uh, oftentimes it means that you have misunderstood something about the core audience, and we were reminded about how many people uh, love Oath and just what a vibrant. Um, community of Oath players we have. And so one of the things I asked for on my own internal wish list, uh, which I brought to the operations team, was to see if we could have a little bit more pre-production time before we took the game into production. So when you uh, in, in within a studio, pre-production time is time you use to determine the full scale and scope of a project. Usually we put a game into production about one month or two months before a crowdfunding campaign begins. And that means like we know what the game's going to be. We, there are lots of outstanding questions, but we know what it's going to mean to work on a game for the next, you know, I'll call it the next year for, for the average project or more. Um, but because the campaign did really well, um, 
I was asked internally, like, oh, what are some little things that you would like to, to do based on this campaign? I said, well, I'd love to keep the design in pre-production a little bit farther so I could do weird experiments with Oath and see if they bore fruit. So one of the things we've been doing over the summer are these weird Oath experiments, and some of them have borne fruit and some of them haven't, uh, and that's just been a delightful part of the whole, of the whole project because uh, I, haven't felt, um, I haven't felt rushed, which is great. Um, okay, so what have we actually been doing? So the Oath New Foundations uh, project has a few different sections to it. Uh, it has the revamp of um, the Chronicle phase, which itself has the Empire component, the Chronicle cleanup tasks. Uh, we have the lineage system. So all of those things collectively, I'm going to group in one camp and just call it like Chronicle stuff. So we've got this big group lineages, empire tiles, the shadow denizens, uh, the way the foundations work. That's all chronicle stuff. So that's that's group one. Group two is content. So more denizens, more edifices, maybe some more relics. Uh, that's all kind of group two. So we've got group two. And then group three is the uh, slight rewording of the rules of Oath. So, so this is about looking at the core architecture of Oath and doing things to make it a little bit more modular uh, and also doing a little bit of cleanup where we think cleanup can happen and also tightening the screws a little bit. Are there If there are systems that we think that we could do a little bit better, well, let, let's figure out how to do them better. So that's kind of group three. And then group four, the final group, is of course all the stuff related to the solo game. Now, Liz is not in office today. Uh, she has family visiting, so she's having a wonderful day off, I hope. And uh, But I will say just, just a word about uh, the status of Oath Solo. Liz and Ricky have been doing a really great work, and the current Oath bot, which I played against in a two-player game uh, last week, uh, or not last week, earlier this week, is really good. Um, it is much more organic than the old flowchart bot, uh, and it scales really beautifully with one or two players. I think it might be able to be used uh, for more. It can also work in Chancellor, Citizen, and Exile seats. Um, so I, I played a, a two-player game with, with the bot in it, and it, it just felt really good. So I'm very, very happy with that. The, the, the solo work um, kind of divides into two groups. The first half of the solo product is stuff that can be used in any game of Oath. And then the, the second half is probably going to be things that are tuned specifically to the new content we're building in this uh, wave of new material, the new foundations material. And that stuff hasn't been built yet because we want to make sure that the design for that is pretty stable before I ask Liz, to spend, Liz and Ricky to spend time working on the bot. Um, ooh, someone asked a very good question, which is, are there any proposed changes to the combat system? Yes, sort of. We'll talk about it. Um, so one of the things that I did, uh, part of doing any kind of design work, I mean, so if you have never built an expansion before, if you have built an expansion before, uh, the way you build an expansion is you look, you just build it the way you build an expansion. It, 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 the, the sounds a little circular in its reasoning, but actually um, once you have a pattern for what an expansion could be for a game, it's pretty, it's not easy, but it, there's a clear roadmap for how you build an additional expansion. If you haven't built an expansion before, what you have to do is go into the core logic of the game and you kind of need to like de-age it. You like sort of rewind it back a little bit so that things are a little loose. And then when they're in that loose set, you can kind of reform things. So there are a number of Oath systems which were introduced uh, either early in the game's design, but didn't receive a ton of scrutiny, which I'll talk more about that later, or were introduced very late in the design, things like the combat rework, um, that when you rewind Oath a little bit, those get loose again, and you can start rethinking ways to build them out. Um, so, for example, uh, and I'll actually, I mean, uh, gosh, there's so much to talk about. Oh, boy, I, I've, I have missed... Um, chatting with you all about some of this design stuff. So um, Oath has, has a few systems that were introduced very late. One of them is negotiations. I know it seems silly because Oath, Oath has so many negotiations in it, um, but actually a lot of the card powers that introduce negotiations 
Um, even things like the chancellor citizen negotiation for citizenship, that was that was a pretty late innovation. And what you can tell it was because if you look at all the different cards in the oath database, so let me like, I'm gonna, you know what I'm gonna do? Look at this, look at this magic here. Uh, so we're gonna go to cards.leadergames.com and I'm going to look at the deed writer. So here's the deed writer. This is a very late, a late design. Uh, I guess I can zoom in like this. That's not, it's kind of horrible, but you'll note that the action on this card is, is quite long. It's uh, four lines of text. Negotiate a binding exchange of favors, secrets, and ruled sites with any player. Old ruler moves warbands to the board. New ruler moves warbands from the board. Okay, cool. So there's the deed rider. Now the Tinker's Fair. This was one of the first negotiation cards in the game. Negotiating a, a, a negotiated binding exchange of favors, secrets, and relics with any player. So here we have a couple of these negotiation cards. Just a little, little Drew note. Uh, I should probably mute my messaging. Um, so the uh, these cards we didn't really have like negotiation rules that were built into the design of the game. So one of the things that I've been doing is I have been working in the law to create a boilerplate uh, rule for negotiations. It handles all negotiations in the game. And then what I can do with, with, with a card like, uh, well, for example, let me show you one of the cards that we're working on here. This is a new card. Uh, let me bring it up one second. This is this card. Okay, so here we have a card. This is brand new, this is a new denizen. This is the traveling negotiator. So you can see how this is templated differently. So this says, when negotiating, you can may negotiate with any player on the map. The map. That's the, uh, the text on it. And there's the illustration from Kyle. This was a very recently completed illustration. Um, so uh, we have so we have this travel negotiator card, and we have a win negotiating tag. Now, what that means is that now the a new version of the deed writer could just say, "When negotiating, you can negotiate for the ownership of sites," and here's what that means. Um, so this actually allows us to write the cards in a more economical sense that leans more on the core structure of the rules. So one of the things that we're doing with new foundations is we're going to um, republish some of the cards from the base game with shorter text that actually builds on the game's rules. And so my general rule for, for development here has been, uh, I want the most complicated oath card to have already been written. We are not trying to design a more complicated oath card than the one that we actually are, the ones that we already have. And in a lot of places, I'm looking at the more complex oath cards and thinking, is this a way? Is there a way that I can build this into a new um, game level effect uh, that will uh, allow us to communicate what a card does more e easily? I mean, another example actually to go back to um, our card database. And someone asked it if the card database site is new. It has been live uh, for a while. But we haven't like really started sharing it with people yet. So a lot of the, the Woodland Warriors, you guys already know about it. Uh, more people will learn about the card database soon. But it has all the cards from all of our games, including ARCs. Okay, so let me uh, show you another example of what I mean. Uh, so some of my favorite cards in the game uh, are like these cards. So this is the, the Secret Police. Enemies can't play Visions face up while their pawn is at a site ruled by the secret police's ruler. This boilerplate, like, ruled by the secret police's ruler and, like, its enemies of the ruler, uh, there are a bunch of these, like, forced labor behaves kind of in a similar way, right? Enemies cannot search unless they give to the ruler. I'm like, oh, these are, these global effects are, like, effects that are helping just the ruler, and I almost want to give them like a different UI frame. So I don't know for sure if we're going to do that, but it, it is something that I'm looking at right now as we go through all of these um, all of these cards and look for commonalities and new ways to do templating. Now, uh, Mangofeet asked, um, does this mean negotiating has become, become a kind of a basic action? And the answer to that question is yes. So uh, 
we're we are in a funny place right now in in the design of the game because uh, the game's rules live in three places. They live in all of the print and play kits that we share during the Kickstarter. So I had to write up those rules, and they they sit in those those kits, and Josh edited them. So that text is like pretty good, uh, but they're in weird three three things. Uh, and then, um, and by, by three things, I mean they're in they're split across different PDFs. So that's that's one place where the rules live. The second place is I have a Google Doc with just tons of oath rules and design thoughts in it. So a lot of the development rules sit in there. And then the third place is like on physical components where we're like writing them out or we're putting them on player aid cards. Now that is not sustainable. And we are pretty close to being able to start the next round of testing for this new oath stuff. And so in order to facilitate that, I am in the process of reworking the law of oath. So let me show you. So what I did is I just copied the text of the uh, of the Law of Oath to a new document. This is the new Law of Oath for use with new foundations. And I just copied it in here. And I actually, I relaxed the layout a little bit. And what I've done is I just put a bunch of column breaks throughout these rules to give me white space to work with. Because one thing that Josh and I have both learned, and I'll, I will talk about more changes here in a second. But one thing Josh and I both learned is I think when we were working on Oath, we tried really hard to keep the rule book to eight pages and we did it successfully. But the, the page count is a lot less important than white space. And so I'm guessing that the new, the new law of Oath is going to be a little bit longer. I would guess that it's going to be 40% longer or so, maybe 50% longer. But in terms of page count, it might be twice the page count or even three times the page count because we want a slightly slightly more conversational style, but also just like just room, just like room for less words per page. So what I've done here then is for when it comes to the development of the game, uh, we are going to be using, instead of using a Google Doc, we're going to be using a law document that has any changes from the base game's law in purple. And if I go to the minor actions here, you can see that 6.6 .6 is a new minor action. I don't know if you guys can read this very well. But this is the negotiate action. If your pawn is at the same size as another player, you may exchange favor, secrets, and non-binding promises for future actions. This minor action can be modified by additional powers. So that's the core negotiate rule. And it would the new tinkerer's fair would read when negotiating you can exchange relics or you can give other players relics and take relics from them. So then when you see the tinkerer's fair, whoops sorry, when you see the tinkerer's fair, you it's immediately clear that what it's doing is adjusting how um the negotiation base rule works. Uh, someone asks a very interesting follow-up, which is, does that mean you're going to be doing new player boards? The answer to that is maybe. Um, I would actually like to do new player boards because I think the Oath player boards are a little too long. And if we make the, the, Oath, the new Oath player boards a little bit narrower, uh, they can fit in the box better. And we're, we're just starting. We're at the very beginning of sorting through how all the all the stuff is going to fit in the box, or if we're going to have to use two boxes or whatever, or uh, we could use a box extender like they did with the new Thunder Road stuff. There, there, there's a bunch of options that, that we're kind of sorting out. It's still a little too early to get into it, but I am uh, I'm quite interested that in the possibility of uh, of messing with the messing with with, with the player boards. Um, so you can see here uh, citizenship. Um, is getting uh, a slight slight reworking. This is actually happening because um, of the way that the, the the reliquary as a concept is kind of being sunsetted, uh, and so we, we're having to rework the way the citizenship rules uh, operate. Um, so someone asked, uh, so is this like an Oath Second Edition or something? So that's a great question. We actually one of the experiments that that I did over the course of the past few weeks really is I, I went back to the places where I felt like um, Oath, the character of Oath as it was published really came about. And I looked at those places and said, could we do something more dramatic? Could we make like Oath second edition? And what I found, and so the, this included things like a dramatic rebuilding of the combat system, like a dramatic rebuilding of the combat system, a dramatic rebuilding of like the core action loop, um, we, I did a big experiment. I mean, we, gosh, I was up late working on this for just a couple weeks and we, we were playing versions of Oath that 
did not even necessarily look like Oath. And the sum result of that is, uh, I think it's intriguing, but there's too much that would need updating. And I wasn't sure that the thing that we would ultimately produce would be that much better. And so, you know, I, I, I told our staff developer that, you know, one thing that I felt like I learned when I was working on Premiere and John Company is you should only really do a second edition if you feel like you can make something twice as good uh, or, or better. Uh, and, and with Oath, I just felt like I could really labor on this thing all day and night and it would be like 20% better or 30% better. And so I'm not thinking about this as Oath, the second edition. I'm thinking about this like um, Prophecy of Kings in the context of TI, which is to say... I view Prophecy of Kings kind of as like TI 1.5. And I actually, I think that um, Prophecy of Kings for my money, I mean, oh God. Well, so so Matt right now, right now is is uh, um, is is in a meeting. So he's not going to contradict me here. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, but I, I will say that um, I think my, my view on Prophecy of Kings and TI is that it is 60% great. 20% like okay and then 20% like kind of bloated. And so I I have folded Prophecy of Kings into my TI games. I like Prophecy of Kings. I wish there was a little bit more editorial restraint. I probably won't go back to TI4, just neutral TI4, but I'm trying to look at the new oath stuff in a similar mentality which is you flip a switch and then everything new activates. Uh, as opposed to you know a big grab bag, and that that's stuff that we that we talked about a long time ago uh, during the campaign. Okay, so uh, let's talk about other places where the rules turned purple. So um, you know, for instance, uh, I'll show this is actually here. Here is a funny. This is a this is a low controversial thing. Um, so over here, the recover action is now a lot smaller. It's like okay, you know, choose a. Choose a target, spend your supply, pay the cost, take it, whatever. Now you might say like, oh, well, what what changed? This looks how the recover action looks. Well, in Oath's rules, all of the recovering rules for the Darkest Secret and the People's Favor were hard-baked into the law. But because of the foundation system, the Darkest Secret could change its recover cost. And so we need a rule that is more fundamental. So what I'm going to be doing then is I've got this recover action here, and then at the end of the rules, uh-oh, Whoops, uh, I, hit, hit, I hit page down in the wrong application. So then at the end of these rules, you'll see doo, 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 that I'm going to be starting a power appendix over here, and that is going to include things like, hey, here's, how, here's the recover action for the people's favor, for the darkest secret, for the sigils, for the banners, all that kind of stuff. Um, yes, and, and that's exactly right. So basically, because... Um, banner doesn't mean what I need it to mean anymore. I'm I'm now capturing like symbols. So the, the darkest secret, the people's favor are symbols. Uh, you can choose uh, a relic or a symbol. And then you've got the banner, the people's favor is a symbol. The sigil of the people's favor is a, is a, is a symbol. And there's a couple other ways that we're, that we're kind of sorting, sorting it out. Um, yeah. So, so banners are like, um, and, and this is really just a happy accident. So, for example, there are all these cards that refer to things like the Darkest Secret in the game, but we usually didn't write Banner of the Darkest Secret on the card because it would just take up a lot of space, and everybody knew we were talking about the Darkest Secret. This has the handy advantage of now if we create something called the Key of the Darkest Secret or the Sigil of the Darkest Secret or the, the Image of the Darkest Secret or whatever, the Mural of the Darkest Secret, that's a bad example. But if we were to, uh, if we have these different variants, any card power that keys off the darkest secret um, will also key into that. Uh, oh, uh, someone asked, um, are there any updates on the ARCs errata pack? I have a very small update, which is uh, we have all the pricing and we have scope. Um, we are finalizing the actual card list. We will have a big announcement about that probably after the root campaign. But the long and the short of it is y'all are going to be super well taken care of. Like we've decided to not only reprint the single card, but to actually re reprint several cards that have just small issues of errata. N nothing balanced, no but like small gameplay things and, and things that um, work out so some rules questions, common rules questions. And we're going to be able to send those to all the backers and to everybody uh, for basically no cost. Um, so we are, we're figuring that out. Um, 
Okay. Yes. Uh, so uh, thank you for that uh, for that question. Uh, let me actually show you. I wonder if I have this handy. Oath card. Yeah. Okay. So um, I will. Uh, I want to show you this really cool resource that um, our summer intern Emma, who just left us, uh, who is a one, who is a wonderful intern, um, she made this uh, very handy thing, which is the oath. <laughs> card mechanism uh, spreadsheet. And so it, ba it has a full, uh, it's a full tabulation of every oath card. And so like, I know that there are 15 cards in the deck that interact with the darkest secret. There's one in discord. It's card 79. There's six in arcane. It's these, it's, there's one in order. So I know that if I am like playing around with, with a core element of the law that like changes how visions work, there are 12 cards that I need to review to see if they need editing. Uh, and it is just super helpful. Um, and so I really, I really dig it. Um, okay, cool. So there's, the, I just wanted to show you this neat, neat resource. And then she made this giant, I don't know. It's awesome. She, she did a fantastic job. I was so happy with how, uh, how the, this resource has turned out. It's been so useful as we've been uh, going about things. Uh, okay. There's that. Uh, so will Oath of Protection still be banners only since the station exists? So the Oath of Protection will change to be relics and symbols and we'll have, we'll have reprinted punch board to capture that. But really a symbol is a banner, uh, for all intents and purposes, except, <clears throat> uh, if the foundations swap the banners for a different symbol. So if you move to the sigil of the darkest secret, you know, the darkest secret in any of its forms is a symbol or there'll, there'll be a symbol of it. Um, speaking of, well, let's see, should we talk more about the rules and then talk about the other stuff? Oh, there's so much. Let's talk about the rules a little bit more. So someone asked about the, um, someone asked about the combat rules. So I went on a big journey here. Uh, I basically made two different combat systems uh, that were both neat. In fact, people on, some people on staff were like, you should make a game with this combat system. It's cool. Uh, but it, I just, I, I wasn't happy with it. It would require too much work. I mean, there are a lot of battle plans. Uh, in fact, I could even like use Emma's tabulation here to tell you that there are uh, 80, 112 battle plan cards. Kind of. I mean, a lot of those have to do with war bands. Uh, but combat dice, like 42 battle plans, that's that's a lot. It's a lot. Um, so what what we're what I'm gonna do is and, and we are still vetting this, is after testing some wild combat systems, I I kept returning to the fact that um Oath's combat has an advantage that Arx com Arx's combat doesn't have, which is Oath's combat always produces an, a winner and a loser. Uh, Arx doesn't do that. Arx is, it's, it's purely attritional. You have an impulse. It has uh, an input and an output. But the, the game doesn't make any judgment about if that output is victory or not. It's sort of up to the players to do that. This fits great in Arx, which is a very loose and flexible action structure. It doesn't really work in Oath, where you need like a narrative beat. So, uh, so I like the fact that Oath has winners and losers. And what I want to do is even stretch this out. So I have one adjustment to combat right now. And then there's a bunch of smaller adjustments. But the adjustment to combat, uh, which does change how combat feels a lot, and it has a mechanical implication, but the actual rules implication is very subtle. And all it does is the defender now rolls after the attacker has made all of their decisions. So you, you declare your targets, you gather the dice pool, the attacker uses their battle plans, the defender uses their battle plans, and then the attacker rolls and sacrifices their war bands to get their combat total. And so they'll, they'll call it out. They'll say, hey, defender, 20. Then the defender rolls and you see if the defender was successful in th their defense. The advantage of this is the dramatic moment in combat is when the defend defender's dice are rolled. 
in order to get it to feel right, to feel climactic, that should be happening at the end. Now, this was an issue where, again, I think I see my own biases as a designer and developer because when I was working on Oath, I was trying to be so economical. And so I said, well, it would be better if the defense dice were rolled at the end. But if we have the attack dice rolled first, combat is like, you know, it's a few seconds faster to resolve. I think that was a mistake because now what happens is the, um, the attacker, if they roll bad, has to make a decision about how much they're going to sacrifice before they see the blue dice, which means they're going to lose more battles. Now, that, that's the kind of like high level r result of this, but there are also downstream consequences. So for instance, we can now, as a term, have combat cards. So I like, like, consider longbows, right? So longbows to me is an interesting card that I've never liked how it's been designed. I wonder if I can very easily bring up longbows without breaking a file. Let's, let's go on an adventure together. Bum, bum, bum. Uh, okay. We're looking for longbows. I'm in the game's production file, so I will not be saving whatever I do. And this is the Denizen deck. Here we are. Here we are. Uh, let's, here we go. So these are the actual production files for ARC. So I'm going to mess around with these files. So longbows I've never been happy with. Now, why have I never been happy with it? Well, I haven't been happy with it because plus or minus an orange dice, I, I like that as an economy of style. Like, yes, plus or minus an orange dice is simple. It's great. You got these two-tone battle plans. But what I, what I, what I don't like about it is Longbows, first of all, should have a different effect for attacker or defender. If you're attacking with longbows, it should be less effective. So I actually, I don't mind like a plus um, combat die for the attacker. I don't mind that too much. But as the defender, like, wouldn't it be better, for instance, if I could just, um, I'm looking for the shape I need. There he is. If I could just add uh, shields, let me uh, oath. Public. There we go. Right. And now, like your longbows are going to be an extra dice, but they could cause the loss of your own stuff. But if you're defensive, longbows are great. They're just going to give you two extra shields. Now, this wouldn't be multi. This wouldn't be multiplicative, right? You wouldn't want printed shields to have like that. That the power of the times twos. But hopefully you can see that like this actually provides like a lot of like interesting tools. And if I want this kind of stability on the attack, right, you could imagine designing a card that would go say like this, right? Where it's like, ah, oh, yes, these are your like knights or whatever, and, or like your, your little lancers. And they're just going to give you a bunch of hits. You don't have to worry about your guys dying. Uh, and on defense, like they're a little weaker on the defense. So <laughs> there are some like little things where, um, we now have additional design grammar, and that might mean that we decide to reprint the longbows card and change what it means. And we would, you know, if, if we did this, we would, of course, like put a little, you know, a little shape in the corner uh, to say like, yep, this is a new foundations card. We'd make a little glyph that we'd sit here. <laughs> or you put it behind the card number or whatever, right? So it'll it'll be really clear what we need to do. And I don't know wh which cards are going to need to get updated, anything like that. I just, um, this combat rework critically allows us space to say like, which of these battle plans isn't hitting uh, as well narratively as it could be? And then are there things that we can do to clean it up? And critically, the overriding concern of all this stuff is um, Oath is so crystal clear in its storytelling and it can get bogged down when the card text gets like a little too long or the, the mechanisms get like a little too opaque. So I'll give you another example of that. The Darkest Secret has a recovery condition on it that has to do with matching warbands. And the idea, the thematic idea of it is that if you are traveling in areas where you are surrounded by your friends, then it's hard for people to steal the Darkest Secret from you. But if there are people that you don't know, if you're hanging out with strangers, it's easier for people to find it. Now, this is a great mechanism. It produces really interesting board state, but it is so hard to remember. 
And so we're looking at the Darkest Secret right now, the banner of the Darkest Secret. And I think the fact that it doesn't have anything on the back, we might reprint it with like a protected side. And there are conditions where you would flip it to its protected and unprotected side. And so there, again, this is about making it a, the game state a little bit more transparent, a little bit more bitey. Um, and of course, that's going to create situations where sometimes things that wouldn't have been allowed before, like for example, in, in Oath, I think that generally the attacker wins battles too much. I think that, that the system is too um, too kind to the attacker. And so these adjustments, to me, put the world in a better balance. You know, you're subject to taste, of course. But it now allows us more, more design space and more thematic space. Uh, so no Empire and Arms style ratios, but improvement in other ways, I think. Okay, I'm going to uh, close this file before I accidentally save over it. Uh, so yeah, that's the adjustment to... Um, the campaign rule. And then the biggest area of adjustment, which I haven't even colored purple yet, um, is the writing the, the chronicle phase. So you can see now uh, the writing the chronicle was one page before. Now it is, um, it's sprawling into three columns from two columns. So I've added about 50% to this. Uh, but oh my gosh, it is so much more detail. And there's so much more fun stuff happening here. Now, know what? Don't worry about like taking a screenshot and trying to decode this. We will be sharing this stuff in just a few weeks, and I'll talk more about the schedule soon. But I did want to highlight the new way that we're doing um, the people's favorite task. So I mentioned back during the Kickstarter that, and actually here, let me um, do, 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 do these. Okay, so we have these cards that you hand people at the end of each game. This is the enacting the people's will card. So you give this to the player with the people's, the people's favor. And they get to determine how the deck is built. Uh, I mentioned <laughs> when we were doing the Kickstarter that I was not happy with this card. And I worked on it a bunch this summer, and I have a system that I'm really happy with. And here's how it works. Uh, I, I Actually, I wish I had TTS open or something so I could like actually show it to you on a table, but I'll just describe it instead. So now, uh, so this card governs how the deck changes. And this is actually a pretty dramatic uh, departure from the old way that the deck worked. And I think this one is a lot more interesting, even if it's is slightly too stable. Uh, or not, not too stable, but it's a little bit more stable. So the way it works is the first thing that happens is you gather up all the discards. So if you've got the people's favor, you're gathering up all the discards. You shuffle them up. And you make... Um, some piles. You're going to make a number of piles based on how big the people's favor is. So in a game where the people's favor is very low, you're not making very many piles. In a game where the people's favor is worth a lot, you're making a lot of piles. Every pile has two face down cards from the discards and one face up card. Once you've made your piles, as the player with the people's favor, you're going to decide half of them are going to be saved. They're going to go to the deck and be fine. The other half are going to be dispossessed. So when you look at a pile, it might have a card you don't like on top, but you don't know what the other two cards are. So you're working with imperfect information. The cards you dispossess, critically, you reveal all of them. And then you add new cards from the opposite suit. So if you dispossess a beast, you're going to add an arcane card to the deck. If you dispossess two discord cards, you're going to add two order cards. This means that all six suits now have these binaries assigned to them, which means the discord order binary, let, let's say there are, um, I don't know, nine cards of each suit in the deck. That's about what the starting deck is. <coughs> the, the, there's a, there's a, a binary, a kind of spectrum of 18 cards. So there could, if there are 18 order cards in a deck, there are zero discord cards. And likewise, if there's 18 discord cards, there are zero order cards. And so the deck will always be kind of like balancing on those sort of six teeter-totters, if that makes sense. <coughs> um, what this does is it makes the deck adaptations feel really earned and interesting, and it gives players so much more control over which cards are added to the deck. Because previously what would happen is oftentimes you would be adding these three, two, one, like little chains of cards down and it wouldn't have anything to do with the cards you were kicking out. And I thought, well, this is not feeling as organic as it should. And so I wanted a system where, where players could, I don't know, be, or feel like the world was actually 
responding to the decisions that, that they were making. Um, this also stops the game from getting too weird. Um, Oath, it's possible for suits to like fully leave uh, Oath archives. Um, it, it's hard, but it could happen, especially if you get your Chronicle in the like 30 plus, 40 plus game range. Uh, and Oath actually tolerates it fine until you get down to only about three suits. As soon as Oath only has about three suits in the deck, it behaves really weird. Um, and th that is a very rare thing, but this system will basically ensure that never happens. Uh, and it does a lot more, a lot more self-balancing. Uh, okay, so yeah, one thing that we've been working on are, you know, getting all these uh, Chronicle cards operating well and figuring out what, what jobs people... Uh, have to have to resolve at the end. Uh, this has actually allowed us to do some interesting things. So for instance, I'll share another one with you. This is the Shape the Foundations. <coughs> uh, this is actually the old card. I haven't corrected this to be the new thing. So this is pretty much what we had for the Kickstarter. Kickstarter says, ah, you have the darkest secret. Why don't you draw a bunch of foundation cards, depending on the value of the darkest secret, and choose the one that you want to change, like the, the, the rule in the game that you want to change. Okay, so we've changed this. Now, what's going to happen is the darkest secret is always going to be associated with two foundation cards, always two. And anyone who has the darkest secret can know what those foundations are. And remember, foundations like dramatically change the game. So you might, you might have the darkest secret and know like, oh, this is going to change like how bandits work. Or maybe I could change how exiles can hold land. But the darkest secret... I can you can see it's like a limited prophecy. At the end of the game, the player who's holding the darkest secret, they choose which one of those things they want to do. And then they use the value of the darkest secret to set the game's next like puzzle. Um, so that way the darkest secret is something. When everyone's passing it around, it has like a real value. <laughs> and th this this thought came to my mind when I was I was playing some John Company. Uh, somewhat recently, and there was a um, there was a uh, blackmail card that had like traveled halfway around the table in a high player count game, and I was like, oh, I love the fact that a lot of people know what this card is and they're talking about it. And I've played a lot of John Company, but I couldn't quite figure out which which one it was. And I'm like, this is a good dynamic, and I wish the darkest secret felt like this. So this will bring some of that energy to it. Uh, now, uh, Dark, uh, Dark Meku here asks, uh, is there a way to reset the game when the new expansion comes out? I'd love to be able to rebalance it back to normal. Yes. So there are going to be two, uh, at least two sets of instructions for setup. One will let you convert your current game into the, uh, the new expansion. <coughs> Excuse me. The other one will, um, will allow you to start a Chronicle totally freshly, uh, with all the new material. So we will, uh, be able to hopefully take care of everyone uh, there. Sorry, I've got it's dry or something. Uh, okay. Uh, what else do I have to say about this? Mm -hmm. uh, ooh, gosh, I'm getting baited by this Brodell question. Do I have any Brodell here? I don't think so. It's all home. Uh, so you guys can see, but I have uh, my... my Bookcase is right above my desk in my new office layout. Um, you can see my fig tree. Fig tree, he's over there. He's doing really well. Um, he's 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 back at it. Uh, he was he got <laughs> he was in a rough way, but he's he's perked up. Uh, okay, so someone asked about Fernand Brodel, uh, which was a really big inspiration um, to uh, to the structure of Oath. So Brodel. Uh, you know, practitioner, founder of, uh, of the Annals School and this notion of the long durée and of understanding um, history from, I mean, almost a geological perspective and really thinking about, you know, movements of like people, geography, weather, and take it when you, when you write history, you're about capturing the past in the widest, the widest possible aperture, not just looking at um, what some king or queen was doing. So I'm, I'm quite quite moved by his work, um, and it, it's it's I, I return to it a lot. Um, Oath is at a generational scale and is and is gra gradualistic because of Brodo. Now, the critical one system that we're working on, which I hesitate to show y'all because I don't I'm not a hundred percent sure that it can work, 
is um, we are rebuilding the site logic basically from scratch. So let me just tell you what we're doing with the caveat that this might not work. So back during the Kickstarter campaign, I showed the picture of the plastic overlay on the card and say, oh, look, the site has become brambled. And isn't that, it's interesting, right? We have a, the new, new kind of site, site effects, enchantments and things. And I mentioned that maybe there was a more dramatic way to introduce the system that could change the site logic of Oath itself, but I didn't have time to explore it because we were running a crowdfunding campaign. Well, in the months since, we have explored it, and it works. It works actually really well. Um, basically, what we did is we went. So the 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 caveat here, and I will write like a super long piece about the rebuilding of the site logic uh, if it works. And maybe you know if the experiment fails, which it still might. Um, I'll write maybe I'll write an article about its failure because I think that would be as interesting. Um, basically, what we did is uh, the sites in Oath were designed very quickly. They were basically designed over a long weekend, and then they never changed. Because I was like, yeah, I want a drowned city, I want a buried giant, <coughs> I want this, I want that, whatever. But they basically never changed. And um, we added things to them as the, the game went on. We're like, oh, what if you could start during the wake phase and gain resources? Or like, what if, uh, I don't know, there are homelands or this and that. Um, what we decided to do is I took out all the site cards and put them out on a table. And with my little team this summer, I said, here's our design experiment. Can we create an adaptable site system that will grow and change with its players as the game is played? And we're going to do this by imagining the site as not being one thing, but being three things. So there is the core geographic reality. So like a, a, a mountain pass. Can't change anything about a mountain pass. It's a mountain pass. Uh, or a, a, a coastline or a river, right? These are the kind of fundamental reality. I said, all right, these things are the f core geographic elements. And what do they do? They inform movement, right? The coasts are adjacent to each other. Uh, the rivers, you can always move downstream. The passes create bottlenecks. Okay, so we don't have that many of them, but we have the a few, and like uh, plains, easy to move out of, mountains, difficult to move out of, right? So we, we kind of like created these like core, core logics. And then I said, imagine that a site can have one improvement. It can have one thing about it that, um, that, 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 that makes it uh, better, enchanted. And, and maybe it can be enchanted and it has secrets that can be discovered there. Or maybe it's a homeland. So if, if this site is a nomad homeland, then players get rewarded for, for putting um, for putting nomad cards there. All right, so we have like now we have a list of like uh, different uh, I'm going to call them enchantments, right? Fundamentally positive things that were added to the game. And then the last thing are corruptions, and these are places where the sites have gotten broken in some bad way. They become horrible, confusing, obscure in, in the context of the original sites of Oath, things like the drowned city, the drownedness. What does it mean that the drowned city is drowned? Well, it means it doesn't have any slots. Okay, that's a power. Or the, the, that, that's a, uh, a corruption. Uh, or, um, for instance, like something being shattered, like the slums in the original Oath sites are shattered, and that is a trait that means you can freely re replace cards as you play them to that site. Uh, shrouded, you know, the, the, the ruler of the site gets to determine where people go when they leave. So one thing that's happened as we worked into this is I was working on the shadow denizens. I could never get them to sit quite right because I just felt like the denizens have all this character. I don't really like the way the shadow denizens are behaving. So what we did was we folded the shadow denizen system into this new site corruption system. And physically, the way it works, if we can get it to work, is that there'll be a card. That's the, the site. And then there's an enchantment, which is a transparent card. And then there is a site's status for corruption. Either it's corrupted or it's not corrupted. And that's like the sleeve that goes over everything. What this lets us do is say, ah, the narrow pass is the homeland for order. And so it has a big order fortress. And, oh, it's been shrouded. So now only the ruler can determine if you can exit it. And so 
the the sites then gain this wonderful thing, which is if you look at the old site reference, here it is. Uh, we have all these like bespoke abilities, and what we fundamentally done is said, look, if you only have a few abilities here and a few abilities here, it's actually less total abilities. But then if you let the site, if you let those build, if you design those abilities to overlap with each other, you're creating like hundreds of different custom sites. Critically, because these the the memory of the sites is encoded by the cards like sleeving status. If you drown a city in one game and it gets lost and it goes into the discard pile, when that city comes up later, it isn't just the drowned city. It's a city that you saw the drowning of in a previous generation. So suddenly the site deck in Oath is able to hold memory in a way that the uh, control of sites could hold memory in previous games. Now, this is all really exciting, and I uh, am so delighted by it, uh, but there are questions about art and technology that we have to sort out before we can like for sure do this, which is why I haven't, I haven't talked about it that much, and I, I don't mind talking about it a little bit here, uh, because I, you know, y'all know me, and uh, you know that like I'm happy to share this, and also it, it could blow up in our face. Um, essentially, it does mean a double sleeve card, although not quite. It means a card a transparent card and then one sleeve. Um, and that's like, we will have to figure out how to print the sleeves in a way. I mean, it is, there are a lot of questions here. It also would require a lot of art because Kyle would need to rethink how the site art works to make it modular. This is the kind of stuff that if this were a video game, it would be awesome because you could just have the art like adapt to, to, to what is being put on. Um, I do think that we can do it. We've been doing a ton of experiments and I'm hoping Within like two or three weeks, we'll have stuff to share. I mean, I actually, I have a lot of a lot of art and things I could share right now, but I didn't want to do that before Kyle had a chance to like really, really play with that. Um, anyway, it it is it is so cool, and it has such interesting game implications, and it's been fun to see people like get attached to the world of Oath in kind of a new way. And on top of everything else, it's not really any more complicated. It doesn't. It's not. Uh, it doesn't add very much. Someone asked, you know, do you recommend if you're a first time playing Oath, would would you recommend starting with the expansion? Um, I would say like yes. We we are. I am building this expansion with the intent that anybody who's playing Oath who wants to get into it should go ahead and just pull it in. There's like not. I don't know if we're gonna make a new playbook, but I think that there's a good chance that we do make a new playbook uh, that says, hey everybody, welcome to Oath, new foundations. If you've never played Oath. Not only do we have a new law for you, we also have like a new playbook. Uh, we probably won't have a demo game because that took a ton of work and I just would rather be designing content than working on one of those. Um, so, do, 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 do. Uh, okay. Um, oh yeah, like uh, someone mentions the, the 300 Scoundrels game or Canvas and like, yeah, absolutely. That is a, like... This thought is happening because I looked at those games and thought, oh, I think there's some really interesting ways we can use card overlays. I mean, one disagreement I have with them is I actually think card overlays are really irritating during play, which is why uh, I bounced off both of those games. How, which is, but in, in the context of Oath, you are only playing with card overlays during cleanup. Like you're just kind of updating the map and then you're packing it away. Uh, Will there be a way to adapt the lineage system to support players dropping in and out? Uh, the answer to that is yes. Or joining a world against bots and returning players having an advantage? Yep. Oh, yep. Fully taken care of. Not a that that is not an issue at all. Uh, so I'm not not worried about that. Uh, okay. And yes, you can still let late pledge. You can still late pledge. But also, I mean, not to dis discourage you from late pledging. But uh, the success of this campaign is what was so great that I love that I'm like doing this stream and I can tell people like, yeah, late pledge if you want. I don't, I, we have budget to make this thing and to make it exceptional. Uh, if you late pledge, you will help us. I mean, that money literally, and I, I talk about this all the time, so I don't want to belabor the point, but um, the money that is funding the work that I'm doing right now is the money that was collected for the Kickstarter. Anybody who late pledges us right now they're probably funding like the ARCs expansion and also the Root expansion and maybe some of the other projects. So it's still going to good things, but um, probably not this. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and Patrick's got his Scrooge McDuck vault, of course. 
Uh, do, 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 do. Uh, yes. So, so uh, this is a really good question from uh, Zambini, which is uh, with the increased suit balance to deck evolution, are you still going to have tools to unbalance things like the Great Supplier? Totally. All that stuff should still work totally fine. Um, and uh, people are asking about uh, the lineages, um, if they're going to be tied to player color. Uh, it's going to be up to the players. Uh, we have, and I don't have this on hand, but we have like player. Actually, let me see if I can find it. This is this is the kind of uh, casual Friday afternoon stream stuff uh, that you probably shouldn't do. So we have these things. Uh, let me like load up a few of them. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And then I'm gonna load up this thing as well. Okay. Yeah. This is. Uh, I got some fun stuff to show y'all. Um, so uh, this. Do 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 do. Um, these are like lineage cards, um, which we're experimenting with some like different ways of, um, like having little cards that are, there'll be a, there'll be a tear sheet of cards and you can just put it in a bag or you can just keep it separate. They don't have to be colored if you don't want them to be colored, but they will record how your games are going. Um, we have, we have been working on a system of legacy points, which basically, uh, allow players to do multi-game scoring. Um, and actually, uh, this was something that we did a little bit on a lark originally, but has been, um, just wonderful. Like, uh, you know, having, having just a little bit of a uh, score incentive has been really fun. Um, and then, uh, also, so, uh, on the same note, we are trying to find ways of doing empire scoring, uh, including things like having timeline sheets. So also our wonderful intern Emma worked on, um, different like ways of doing timeline visualization. Um, and we've been like talking about like building apps, uh, or, and other ways to, to capture this and also ways to do it physically. So there, there's a bunch going on here that I'm not going to talk about too much, but just know that like we are thinking about how players pack away their game, sort their game. And, and the, the, again, the general goal is this is as easy and as clean as, it's ever been like we want the, and it's interesting the, the chronicle steps are the chronicle rules are a column longer, right? So like for all my talk about simplifying the game, you know, I can show you that the revised law of oath is a column, a column longer than it used to be. However, these tasks are now divided among the players much more evenly. And so the resolution of them is so much faster. And also because there are choices being made, it's fun. Um, speaking of which, we also have a system for, um, we now have a system for chronicle destruction, which I really like, uh, where basically if the world is starting to get all corrupted and messed up, um, gradually that the chronicle get, kind of gets sick if the players aren't taking care of it. And then it'll, it'll create like, there's now a window for like apocalypse events where you'll have like things really falling apart quite badly. And if players don't take care of it, there is a, um, there is like a little like a full chronicle collapse that will destroy lineages and the empire and then uh, kind of fully invert the deck. Um, and, and, and the idea is like, you can then keep playing on that chronicle if you want, but there's like a 200 year like dark age that we don't talk about. Right. You know, the archaic Greek period after the bronze age collapse or something where everything gets a, gets a reset. Um, so yeah, all, all that stuff. And yeah. Well, I'm, I mean, I'm open to an app. I think, I have a lot of opinions about apps, game apps, but I think uh, an aid to do some Chronicle stuff would be kind of neat. And and then there's a lot of fun ways to tie it in. Um, when we do move this to testing, I'll just note, um, there's a good chance we create another TTS that is not automated because our our official TTS, as, as people here probably already know, has tons of custom scripting in it that is not going to work. And so we will eventually, we'd love to have a nice... Uh, custom scripted thing, but for the short term, where we when we do move things into testing, we will have a kind of like unscripted TTS mod uh, for people who want to do that do that testing. Um, okay. Uh, all right. So uh, yeah, and I think you know the the those questions, uh, Dark Meku, about like. Should we be putting tokens on the cards? Should we be uh, doing the double sleeving? Uh, I 
like this really is just going to depend on how things feel physically. And so we're, we're doing a lot of physical testing right now. So far, the double sleeving is not bad. It's not really double sleeving. It's two cards in one sleeve. So it's not like two sleeves and it seems to work fine. And also it lets us do uh, some really neat stuff with art overlays. So that if something becomes a homeland, it like Kyle can draw castles on it that kind of like sit on top of the art and compose in really good ways. Hey, thanks. Uh, Computer fountain. It's actually not a pavement poster. It's a silver juice poster. Uh, but Steve Malcolmus, he's there. Um, it's just getting caught. I would I would tilt my camera up, but there's a bookshelf right here, and so I, you'll you'll never see the, the top of my posters. Uh, Orson Welles is still here. He just he lives on that wall now. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's all that stuff. Um, yeah, I, I listen to like American Water constantly. Uh, and, 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 uh, actually, you know what I was listening to the other day? Um, I was listening to the wonderful Purple Mountains, like the most tragic and wonderful album from the last several years. So if you, if you haven't listened to Purple Mountains, um, Bergman's last, last project, it is great. Uh, Okay. So, do, 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 do I want to share that? No, that's not ready. I don't know. There's lots of lots of little stuff there. Uh, and then lastly, I mean, not lastly. So let me, let me actually, I'm going to talk schedule. And then I'm going to show you some fun stuff to kind of end. Um, because I'll talk to you all all afternoon. And I should probably actually, uh, I should actually uh, do the work that I have to do. Uh, so, um, right now, schedule-wise, we have been testing it in office, and we have also been testing it uh, publicly in our St. Paul offices. So we have, uh, over the summer, we had testing nights on many Wednesdays, and we ran three Chronicles. I think they got about three games in, uh, and it worked really good. Uh, but we wanted to take a break from that because maintaining three physical kits, actually four if I include the office kit, was a ton of work. And I just wanted some like a few weeks for actual design. And then we had Gen Con and the ARCs release is coming up and the Oath, I mean, not the Oath, the, the Root campaign is coming. So we got very busy and I said, okay, we're, I'm going to go back to just do design and not do kit maintenance. We are going to be restarting our in-person testing on the Oath material. And then our, my hope is that we will have a big kit update for you all by the end of September which is a little later than I thought. Um, and it's possible that it happens earlier than that. But basically, we're making really good progress. And I would rather give you something that was more polished to play with, uh, especially because like testing's exhausting and I don't want to waste all your good energy um, like on something that I already know is, is a little broken. Um, so the uh, our current plan is basically uh, in within about two weeks, I'll be starting in-person testing for the new oath material and then and also getting the digital stuff ready. And then Josh and uh, and Kyle are gonna be doing a little office visit. Uh, and I'll, so it'll be good to have Josh in person. We're gonna work more on the oath stuff. and then by the end of September before I leave for Essen, um, I would like to have everything like, ready to go. And, uh, and I think, I think we're going to be fine on that because really the normally after a crowdfunding campaign happens, everyone on staff is like totally tapped. And so we, we, I, we often lose like a month of recovery time. Uh, that didn't happen for the oath campaign at all because we had a clear mandate of what needed to happen. And also I was uh, lucky to have on staff, a lot of junior design developer help you know, Andrea and customer service has been helping me and Alita, who's our production assistant and Emma, of course. Um, <clears throat> and so, and then, I'll, you know, and, and, and Megan is just starting so, uh, our, our new graphic designer. Um, so we've actually had like a lot of help and we're able to keep the train moving. So we, uh, in terms of just content, like if I were to just like make a little progress chart of how much content had been designed, we are way over halfway. Um, and then a lot of that stuff needs a ton of testing. Um, but I mean, I, I think that there's a good chance that we are going to have this thing like pretty much wrapped up on schedule, uh, currently. And it's, you know, um, I don't, I think, you know, when I was working on arcs, I knew about, I knew it about this time. So a few months after we were done funding arcs, kind of how long arcs was going to take to realize, um, 
and I, I feel that I've, I'm starting to feel that way about about Oath, and I think Oath is this product is a lot smaller, which is which is good. Um, okay, so that's that's kind of ge the general update. So I would say you know he, keep an eye on the Woodland Warriors uh, within. Three to four weeks, we'll probably have digital kits ready. Anybody who wants to play this stuff can just play it. Um, I've got tons of tons of fun stuff to share. And then lastly, I want to talk about. Um, I mean, I guess I'll talk about. Uh, do I want to save? So we're we're doing a cool thing to the edifice system that I'm really into. The edifice system was one of the last things added to Oath's design, and it's good, but it doesn't grow easily. So, for example. Whenever we'd ask people, what do you want out of the Oath expansion, we would always hear more edifices. And I agree, because I love the edifices. The problem with the edifices is that if I give people 24 edifices, not 24, let's do a multiple of three. Uh, if I give people um, 18 edifices, then that means that when you are at the end of the game and you're picking which edifice to upgrade, you've got this big stack of edifices. And also, if the board is filling with ruins, uh, it actually will, will break the game. The game will stop working if all of the sites are filled with places that can't be traded with or mustered with. And um, so I am doing right now an edifice rework. It's one of the last big scope things that needs done. Um, the edifices are still going to be in the game. They're still going to have ruin sides. The ruin sides are going to behave a little bit differently. And critically, w what I'm experimenting with now is basically putting the edifices inside the regular denizen rotation inside the deck um so these cards so imagine your your base game of oath you just started game of oath and the six edify <laughs> there it is unfortunately unfortunately the plural is edifices uh those six edifices are inside the denizen deck so they're in the world deck you're finding them throughout the game you're drawing them into your into your hand um but and and, and you can play them and edifices are sight only cards, but, and here's the key thing, when you play an edifice in the middle of a game of Oath, it is always played to its ruin side, and it's not locked. Then, at the end of the game, <clears throat> when the game is over, if, if, if the government was stable, if the empire, you know, existed or whatever, um, they can, they have a, they have a currency they can spend for edif edifices they rule to restore those edifices. So the building of an edifice actually means finding the ruin or the blueprint and s playing it, getting it out on the board. And then at the end of the game, you're like, I'm going to restore these two. Um, the edifices will have a card back and the card back will show the ruin side, the illustration, but they'll look a little bit more like a, uh, a, a denizen. It's kind of like a halfway between the ruin side and the denizen. And critically, the edifices will still have a suit. Uh, they will be able to be traded with, but not mustered. And then they'll have some cost to, to restore them, which we're still figuring out. Um, this allows us to actually put a lot more edifices in the game, generally, and uh, it makes them a lot more flexible, and, and it, can, it allows them to intersect with a lot of other different systems. Uh, I, I'm not fully convinced that the system's going to work, but I feel I feel good enough to talk about it. Um, it fixes a bunch of problems, actually, and it allows the system to grow in a more um, a more fulsome way. So I am pretty I'm pretty jazzed by it. Uh, also, side note, um, one thing that I am looking for as I work on Oath stuff are things that I'm calling category errors, and I'll give you my favorite category error I have found so far. Which is uh, one of my one of my favorite dang cards in the game. It's the tribunal, everyone. <clears throat> the tribunal uh, allow it's a negotiation site that allows you to make binding promises. Uh, and I I love this dang card so much. It's so absurd, and it always feels great when it when it's in the game. Uh, and so its power absolutely is going to stay in the game. However, uh, this should not be a site card. This is an edifice. This is very clearly an edifice that needs to get built and that enables this power. And so certain like concepts in the game, another one is like the buried giant. Like should the buried giant be a site? I don't know. Maybe it should be a denizen. And and there are different there are different ways to kind of like reorganize some of the concepts of oath so that we are um being a little bit more consistent. Um and that actually, like, even even trying to answer the question, I mean, I had a meeting a few days ago where I, I <clears throat> asked my dev team, uh, what's the difference between an edifice 
and a, uh, I don't know, a, a card with a global effect and a site power. Like, what are these different categories? Can we create a sense of rules that actually say like, well, no, edifices have this behavior and, and global powers have this behavior, especially because like the empire system, for those of you who have ex who've explored some of the new content, um, the empire cards, those decrees, they behave like global rules, kind of. They kind of behave like edifices. What are they doing? And so what we're trying to do is create a more um, uniform classing of different power types, and that will allow us to improve the UI a little bit and also get the rules to kind of like sit a little bit more naturally in our heads. Okay, so now, now the last thing. So again, the highlights from all this stuff is, my gosh, we're busy in Oathland. You also can't see this, but over here on my right, I have, uh, well, actually, here we go. I'm just going to do it. Uh, these are, this is all the Oath cards, and they just sit here on my desk because, um, there we go. Um, they just sit here because I need to reference them all the flipping time. Oh my gosh, my desk, my shelf. Um, so like, you know, here we go. Boop. Uh, the, I just have, I have bricks of all the oaths. These are just, this is just from an old copy of oath, but I have all of the, all of the cards on hand so that we're having conversations. I'm like, we got to talk about Val of Renewal guys. Um, and it's, it's been so fun to just like have all these, uh, things kind of on my mind. Um, the, uh, you know, the highlight here is we've been busy in Oathland. We are getting a ton of work done. Um, we need a few more weeks to get everything together, but actually in terms of content, we're getting, we're getting pretty close. I mean, I'm feeling good enough to spend, I spent a lot of my week just working on the law and writing rules. So that's always a good sign. But the last thing I want to share with you all as a little treat is uh, let's look at some new denizens. So we have an internal, um, let's see, is it this one? Yeah. We have an internal um, like list of denizens that we have been building for a while. And this is basically when we, when we were first starting to work on the, um, on the expansion, uh, one of the people, Clay Capra, who's our sales director, uh, he really wanted to work on denizens. And I said, great, let's just start working on denizens. So he and Andrea wrote a ton of denizens. And then, you know, at various times, like Josh or Nick or, or myself would, would look at the denizens and give feedback. And then eventually we, we, out of maybe a hundred denizens, we collected like the best 50 ideas. And then we go through, and actually here, I'll, I mean, I'll show you. Um, I have like, I, I print out uh, some of the denizens that I, I, I scribble little notes on these pages. And then what I've been doing is giving Kyle art prompts about every week where I say, hey, here are your five denizens for this week. So he has been working on putting together, putting together denizens. So here's the traveling negotiator denizen. Um, here's Pledge of Defense. Um, this is a, a pretty simple one. It's just a defensive card, but it has a, a discard condition because again, it's a nomad card. Nomad cards often leave after they're active. And here's the fun thing. Um, Pledge of Defense, we've got, we got art, baby. Uh, and so I, I'm just like putting in some of the new art for these cards. Um, and I'm going to do it like this. Um, and let's see what else we got. Uh, sneak attack. I don't think it's ready. Uh, the loyal pet is not ready. So a, a lot of these are not like, um, th th this is a good one. Uh, the red seer. Uh, if you have the darkest secret, you can change the current oath to anything but devotion. Like, what an obvious power to have a power that changes the oath in game, but have it be very expensive and costly. Uh, I can't believe uh, that we we hadn't got this one set. Let me see what uh, what art we've got. Um, okay, so then let me. Okay, and then what happens is the ones I really like, I write on my little no notepad here. So, for example, um, let's see. 52, we did. It's Pledge of Defense. Traveling Negotiator, we did. And then, uh, let's see, 49. Oh, the Search Party. I think we've got a new art for this. There it is. Search Party. It's good. It's, fun. it's so fun seeing Kyle's art. I mean, Kyle's art's always been good, but it's just gotten, it's just gotten really good. Uh, now, our actual graphic designer will do the final layout pass on all these. Uh, I'm just having, I'm just having fun. Uh, th this one let, lets you look at, uh, look at a deck. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, and then favorite son. Here's another obvious one, right? Like just a card that like literally just lets you snipe the people's favor. 
There we go. Woo. It's brilliant. Um, what we're probably going to do with the digital kit, by the way, just so people are aware, is have half of the new denizens uh, in it when it launches and then save the other half for like a second testing tranche a little later on. Uh, and then what do you have? 46. Oh, the league treaty. Okay. Now this card, I'll actually, I'll talk about this card because I love this card, but it actually doesn't work in the way, like it doesn't, uh, template well. So here's the league treaty. Um, <clears throat> so how does this card work? Let's turn off all this check. All favor traded in this region returns to the favor bank. Now, right now, right now, this is happening in the trade phase, so that's not right. So really, this should be during like rest. All favor trade in this region returns to the favor bank. Um, however, the biggest problem with this, so like th this is not correct. Th this need, because it's not happening during that action. It's happening during rest. But the problem, the problem with this card, and this is why I have a flag on it. And actually, I'll show you all. Now I'm showing you guys the real secrets. Whenever there's a problem, I always just make a big pink circle that I <laughs> that I sit here. Uh, we'll, we'll use this, I guess. I don't know. Um, why is it? Oh, I see the pasteboard. Um, it's funny my cards got cleared. I always put a big circle in the pasteboard just to show, like, to remind myself, like, this card's broken. So the problem is uh, global effects. Players always forget to do them. So what we've done usually is the global effects of a card are things that usually benefit the card's owner or ruler. And this is a way to remind that player to do them. So I could even write a rule in the law that says, hey, if you rule forced labor and you don't use it, you can't go back and say they're using it. That's your job as the ruler. The problem with a card like League Treaty is that it's not clear which player benefits from it. So the actual onus of the person who's like resolving League Treaty is unclear. So I really like this card's power. I love how it changes the game's economy. It's not... Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, you know what? I'm sorry for zooming in so closely. Uh, it, but unfortunately, the enforcement mechanism is a little off, so I'm still I'm still working that one out. Uh, that's how it goes. That's just... That, that's game design. That's number one. Uh, do we have the art for town meeting? Maybe. Yeah, we do. Little bell guy. That's fun. That's fun. Uh, oh, it's just, I, I love, I love having Kyle, you know, back in the mix uh, for those, for, for Oath Art. Um, it's so funny. I mean, a lot of the Oath work that we've done has been work that, I mean, he was, he was working on Ahoy. Um, there we go. It's the watchdog. Um, there we go. And so I didn't want to bother him too much, uh, but now, but now we, he's back. It's back in the land of Oath, where he belongs. Whoops. Uh, stump speech we've already got. Um, yeah, so th this is a really cool one. Uh, th this one sucks value out of... Um, uh, yeah, so it's not like this one basically allows you to uh, to put your favor right on the people's favor based on how like powered up the 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 the, the suit is. There's some different ways to to kind of do it. Um, and also, th th this card needs some some punching up. But just like other ways of interacting with the value of the people's favor, here's diplomat. Uh, this card is uh, design problematic because we wanted to make a card that. Um, that was like a stronger version of the acting troop, but the acting troop critically, you may re re recall is limited to a single suit or not. That's not true. A single action. So here's the acting troop. It, it, the acting troop is only the, the trade action. So you get to act as if it is basically half the suits in the game, but only during the, the trade action. The problem with the diplomat is that uh, she has no action restriction. I would like to keep her that way. Uh, however, might have to might have to work work that out. Um, the other take on the, the the diplomat, I'll show you. Uh, I don't have it. I'll just I'll just re retype it. But the other one is um, 
uh, act as if any cards at your site are in your advisors, right? So like this is the other way of doing doing the, the diplomat, which just basically allows you to use your site as your own, which I think is a little bit more thematic. Uh, but this card needs work. Um, it's not, not quite ready for public consumption yet, unfortunately. Uh, so you know what? You know what that means? It means it's a big old big old color circle on it. <laughs> um, and then do I have any other ones to show you guys? Um, we've got like a ton of arcane stuff. Look at this guy. Um, I actually Council Arbiter. This is a uh, this is a, a really cool card. It has some fun in implications. If you hold the darkest secret, this card does not count against your advisor limit. But if you lose the darkest secret, this guy leaves. So basically, while you're holding onto the darkest secret, he'll he'll hang with you. But if ever you lose the darkest secret, he pieces out. Uh, good clear narrative uh, beats with, with that guy. Um, yeah, so there you go. That's just some some new some new denizens. We've got, uh, gosh, we've got a bunch of new uh, edifices too. I think right now uh, we have we're halfway through all the denizen design. So uh, in terms of content, we're halfway through all the denizen design. We're about a third through the new edifice designs. I'm I'm hoping to do three additional edifices for every suit, and we currently have like ten, ten ish. Uh, maybe like eight that I really like. Um, and then the empire system is close. It's like, it's fully concepted out. Um, we just need to do development on it. The new site system is fully concepted out. We just need art and graphics work. Um, the lineage system, I think we're about two thirds through the content. Um, since the Kickstarter, we we punched them up a lot. The effects are more interesting. Actually, there was a really interesting um, there was a really interesting element. Um, one second, uh, what? Uh, there was a really interesting small adjustment to the lineage system that was it was commonly re 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 requested, and I just I was waffling back and forth, but I think I'm fully I'm fully on board, which is uh, the the maintenance check for your lineage, instead of it happening as a minor action, will be an end of game check where you'll like look at your lineages, uh, your your traits, and you'll see like can you maintain them, can you not? It uses the in game uncertainty to check that. Uh, this is nice; it just makes it slightly easier to to build a to build a lineage. Um, so lineage system is good. Uh, the Oh, the foundation system. The foundation system is actually in a really interesting place. So currently we have, so remember, remember the foundation system are, these are places uh, where the law of oath can change. So imagine like a big switchboard and you can like change certain things about how the, the core law of the game works. Currently we have about 10 of those switches working. Uh, I would like to get that number to 15 or 16. Uh, we'll see. Um, I, have a, I have a bunch of ideas. Uh, what, what I've been doing as I come up with ideas is I always grade them like, ooh, this would be neat. And then I grade the, the design liability. And the of course, the ones that are the most interesting, uh, those are the ones that are the most nightmarish when it comes to their design liability. So things like a lineage, uh, a foundation that fundamentally alters the combat system, uh, I, I don't think I can get it to work. I'm like close. I'm close to getting it to work, but I just can't quite. I can't quite sort through it. Um, and so that one's probably not gonna. Probably not gonna happen. Um, there is a. Uh, so I mean, I'll, I'll give it. I'll give a small example. Uh, there is a lineage. Uh, sorry, a lineage. A foundation that changes the rules for trading and mustering, so that you have to have matching advisors. So it basically says. To trade, you need a matching advisor, uh, and to muster, the, the muster formulation is one plus the number of matching advisors. So this actually relates to the player boards, uh, and this is kind of like next week for me or the week after, but I'm working on a version of the, of the player boards where um, you put tiles, in, like they'll be double layered, and you would put tiles over the actions that, that change. Um, so that you can really clearly see like what, what the impacts of the different foundations are. Uh, there's a foundation that changes a little bit how supply works that I really like. Um, I don't know. I mean, I haven't, I haven't, I'm not like the, 
the foundations for me are still um, I'm it's a powerful tool and I like haven't quite figured out precisely how I want to use it yet uh, because all of the other stuff has been so so uh, it's it, it's it's paid dividends so quickly right whereas the foundations you know for, for example imagine your ch- like you know you have to choose and and, and you, you can choose between um, changing the nature of the darkest secret or making it so exiles can keep territory from game to game. Which would you pick? And it's like, well, are you an exile? Is that is that the thing that's informing that, that choice? Is it, if something is going to change the texture of the game, is that something that um, players are going to like do metagame planning on? I don't, I don't know. And so we're, I'm hoping that gets borne out in, in testing. So it's funny because the, the foundation system, which was really the foundation of the whole expansion has been the part of the design that has both been like kind of easiest and also least exciting for me. Now that everything else is squaring up, I can go back to the foundation system and think like, okay, this is how I want this to fundamentally change the, the character of the, the character of the design. But we'll see. We'll see. Um, so I got a, uh, a weedy question from Sycophant, uh, which is, will the advisor limit be streamlined in the expansion? I don't, I don't really know what you mean. You can have three advisors in Oath. Um, <laughs> so, you have three advisors. I will say, you know, one of the most common questions that I see when people play Oath is when they're allowed to discard their own advisors. And uh, the rules are pretty clear. I mean, the rules are very clear. But I do think that we could add some additional text to be like, hey, on your turn, you can always discard advisors. It's a minor action uh, to discard a face-down advisor. Discarding other advisors only happens when you go over advisor limit, etc. And so I think that there are like there are some ways that we can we can better better capture that. Um, the advisors are going through a little bit of an interesting uh, not reworking, but I'm sorting through something because we have a we have a new mechanism that allows for like virtual advisors um, in the sense that players can now. Um, there are things that will give you like act as if you have an additional beast advisor. And I'm trying to figure out a good way to indicate that. And that that's just something that's still being, still being sorted, sorted through. Uh, it's pretty boring to talk about though. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Well that, I think that kind of brings me to the end of what I wanted to show you all. Um, you know, in, in short, uh, Oath is going really well, Re- really happy with everyone's work on it. Uh, oh, sorry. Boop, do, 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 do. Oh, yeah. So, boy, that is a weedy question, sycophant. Um, so, the, uh, yeah, cards that modify the advisor limit can get really odd in their implementation, like Family Wagon. Uh, yeah, some of them are going to slightly be reworked. There's There are weird things about, like, when you have to discard down to your limit that, that can get triggered in odd ways. Um, we're going to try to to capture all that. And it also might be that we do a new cut on family wagon. That is a little, that is a little clearer. Um, yeah. And I, and I think that this is just a place where again, like a reworking of how the, the player board is, is structured. I think could go, could go a really long way. Um, okay. Well, thank you all. Uh, it was lovely chatting with you this fine, this fine afternoon. I hope it's, I hope it's as lovely where you're at as it is here in Minnesota. Um, I am so tempted to go to the fair this afternoon, but I'm going to keep working on Oath just a little longer. Um, Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, So, you know, from us, next week, I will probably, a lot of what you heard today, you're going to get in another form, which is a Kickstarter update, uh, probably sometime late next week. I'll I'll kind of, I'll I'll put this all to paper. And then... um, by the end of September, you'll either have a full digital kit or a long update that describes when you'll have the full digital kit. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll say, too, that um, Ahoy, we, we have almost everything in production and ready. I and mean, some of it actually is in production right now uh, for the Ahoy expansion. And uh, the root stuff is really starting to come together. Josh and I played a good playtest this morning, so I cannot wait for you to see the new factions. Uh, and, of course, uh, it has just been delightful to see people respond to arcs so well so that's always i i, I always tell folks i like i hate that, that i have to be working on a game right now because um 
having like working on a game that is not done is hard in the context of people celebrating a game that is done. So I'm always like, oh gosh, how do I like, how do I want to, why do I want to work on Oath when people are enjoying ARCs? Can I just be playing ARCs instead? Um, but of course that's, that's a good problem to have. So I'm not going to complain too much. Um, uh, when are we getting more info on the root factions? In a few weeks. In a few weeks. All right. Thank you all. Take care. Have a wonderful day, and we'll talk soon.